Nationalist China refuses to ratify Britain's treaty with Tibet. Tibet is forced into seclusion from the outside world. Its recognition as a nation blocked by both China and Britain. In 1924, Mongolia is invaded by the Russian Red Army with the help of Mongolian communists. In 1932, the Great 13th prophesies a grim future for Tibet. It will not be long before we find the rat onslaught at our own front door. And when that happens, I must be there old enough to defend my people. Otherwise, our spiritual and cultural traditions will be completely eradicated. Communism is established in Mongolia and Buddhism is destroyed. In 1921, the Chinese Communist Party is founded. So, the great 13th Dalai Lama decides to die ahead of time to allow time for his reincarnation to grow up to serve as leader during the coming existential crisis of Tibet. Having established independence in the modern nation system and overseen 20 years of peace and prosperity, the man whom all Tibetans see as a bodhisattva of compassion incarnate consciously dies in 1933 at the age of 57. Buddhists believe that sentient beings are endlessly reborn under the causal influence of their evolutionary actions in previous lives, their karma. Here, Yama, the lord of death, holds the wheel of life in his mouth. The traveler in the between state falls into the cosmos driven by greed, the cock, delusion, the pig, and hatred, the snake. Only wisdom can break the chain of karma and give freedom from the suffering of the unenlightened life. An enlightened bodhisattva is a heroic being who vows to become a Buddha to free all beings from suffering. In Tibet, accomplished spiritual teachers have perfect wisdom, so can reincarnate consciously, choosing the circumstances of their next lives. Considered a Buddha emanation, a tulku is recognized while still a child. In keeping with tradition, the Dalai Lama's body is placed in state, facing south toward the Buddha's birthplace in India. His body does not decay. It lingers in a state of meditative preservation, which only the highest lamas can achieve. Then, overnight, something unexpected and astonishing happens. On a wooden pillar at the northeastern corner of the shrine near the body sits in state, a strange fungus suddenly appears. Just since yesterday, his head has turned. What can this mean? Following the sign, they run outdoors to look towards the northeast. Look there, in the northeast. To their amazement, they see an unseasonal flock of geese heading off into the distance toward the Amdo province. Curious cloud formations are observed from Lhasa in the northeast above the Potala Palace. Shaped like the strange fungus or the Sanskrit syllable, ah. Look, mother! Wow, never before have I seen such a sight. The High Lama, appointed by the 13th Dalai Lama, the young Reting Rinpoche, serves as regent, his first duty to find the new Dalai Lama reincarnation. Perhaps the Sacred Lake will give us guidance. He consults with Nature, the state oracle, as to the significance of these signs. His Holiness is born anew. Look to the northeast. The regent and his retinue of advisors set out on a pilgrimage to the sacred lake of Hamulhatso, where the future may be discerned. The regent sees, shimmering in the lake, three Tibetan letters. A -ka -ma. What on earth? I see it so clearly in my mind. The vision changes to a distant monastery with roofs of green and gold, and in the nearby village, a simple house, its roof bordered with turquoise tiles. 1936, Tibet's northeastern province of Amdo. Since the breakup of the Manchu Empire, local Chinese warlords have asserted control 
But in small farming communities such as the village of Taksir, the Chinese have little influence. All the Tibetan people are faithfully Buddhist, owing their allegiance to the high lamas of the local monastery and to the government in Lhasa. The people turn their prayer wheels, praying for the birth of the new Dalai Lama. Not far from the village is the house of a farmer, Chögyong Tsiring, his wife, Digi Tsiring, and their seven children, who raise animals, yaks, horses, sheep, and goats, and make a modest living, growing fields of barley, buckwheat, and potatoes. The house is considered blessed because some years ago, the firstborn son, Thubdin Jigmi Nobu, was discovered to be a reincarnated lama, a tulku, who went away to be educated as a monk in the monastery of Kumbum. Chögyong Tsiring and his next two sons, Yalu Tundup and Lopsang Samten, love to raise and trade horses. This, my boys, is the finest and the fastest. Digi Tsiring is much loved and is well known for her kindness and generosity. Here, it's all I have, but you must eat. The youngest child, Lamu Tundup, who attains his goal by the grace of the goddess, is often cared for by his elder sister, Tsiring Dolma. Eat, little one. One day, spring plowing is interrupted by travelers from the southwest. You are our honored guest. We wish only to stay the night. The High Lama is received as the guest of honor and prostrates himself to the Buddha. In the kitchen, the party meets the family. And who is this? Kamutundu asks for the rosary around the man's neck. Mine! Yes, my child, if you can tell me who I am. You are the Sara Lama. Right? Then who is this other Lama here? Oh, this is Slopsang, the groom. Right again, my child. This is Slopsang. We have reason to believe that your son is a Tulku. Revealing himself to be the High Lama of Sera Monastery in Lhasa and having exchanged robes and hat with his servant to test the boy, Kyotan Rinpoche requests permission of the parents to return with another delegation. Ah, take me with you! A few days later, a much larger search party returns. Oh, here they come again. First, our eldest, now another. Having chosen the personal rosary of the last Dalai Lama, the child undergoes further tests. You can have it this time, my child. He ignores the larger drum in favor of the last Dalai Lama's smaller one. He drums just the way we drum during prayers. He even chooses the walking stick which the Dalai Lama preferred. This one! The visions of the regent have been realized and all the signs have been fulfilled. The letter A referred to the region of Amdo. The letter Ka to the large monastery of Kumbum, whose roofs are of green and gold. Both Ka and Ma to the nearby monastery of Karma Sharzon Ritter, high on the mountain above the village. The boy has been found in the house with turquoise tiles. Oh, fortunate ones. Your young son has been confirmed as an incarnate Lama of the highest order. Yet again, we are indeed blessed. Word is sent by telegraph to Lhasa via China and India that the new Dalai Lama appears to have been found. Word returns that he should be brought to Lhasa immediately. But Ma Bufang, the Chinese warlord, who has become the local governor, must be consulted. The mission is explained and he is asked for permission to depart. So, you wish permission to take the farmer's child to Lhasa? He demands that the young Tulku be brought before him for his own inspection. It is explained that the boy is only one of many possible candidates. He is the chosen one. I can see it. The governor demands a ransom of 100,000 Chinese yen before he will allow the journey to begin. The immigration fee is paid in full, Your Excellency. Paid in full? They would not pay so much and so readily were it not the Dalai Lama himself. I need three times as much. But, Your Lordship, we have no more to pay. Then let him spend his time in study and meditation until you find it. Communications with Lhasa appealing for help are now sent directly by messengers 
taking many long months. It is thought best to avoid the telegraph route through China. The young Tulku and his older brother are sent to join their eldest brother at Kumbu Monastery in hopes of drawing as little attention as possible. It is feared that the nationalist Chinese government, on discovering the situation, might assert its own authority. Life in the monastery is difficult for the three-year-old. Sometimes it is harsh. How dare you scatter my book of scriptures? Sometimes kindness is shown. Here, my young initiate, would you like a peach? Even though his brother Lobsang keeps him close company and they play mischievous games together, young Lamutunduk yearns for his parents. Ransom arrives from Lhasa, yet it is only half what the governor demands. But he agrees to take part of the remainder from two pilgrims to Mecca, who are promised they will be repaid when they pass through Lhasa. The governor now agrees to allow the two young brothers to leave his domain, but still insists that one lama remain as hostage. He will be released when I am sent a book of scriptures inscribed in gold and a full suit of clothing worn by the last Dalai Lama. The delegation finally leaves the young brothers as all rejoice later when it is learned that a popular revolt has overthrown the governor and the hostage lama has escaped. 1939 Almost two years since he was recognized as an incarnate lama and just over four years of age, Hamutunduk is joyfully reunited with his family for the long-awaited journey to Lhasa. The two brothers are carried together in sedan chair. Although the young Tulku has been recognized as the Dalai Lama, it is still deemed best not to make his certain identity known even to his family. The two boys nearly topple the sedan chair with the intensity of their wrestling games. All the members of the original search party now join the procession, as well as government officials, the Muslim pilgrims, and great numbers of muleteers and scouts who know the caravan routes across the immensity of Tibet. The caravan travels for three months, stopping sometimes at great monasteries along the way, until finally, a delegation arrives from Lhasa, confirming by its actions what all had suspected. Our son is His Holiness himself. From the plain of Dugutang, the caravan, now grown to a ceremonial procession, leaves for its entrance into Lhasa. Lhasa's joyful people throng the streets to greet and acclaim their new Dalai Lama.